Carl Azuz. An urgent warning from the United Nations leads off today's show. The organization's humanitarian coordinator says more than 20 million people are threatened by famine and starvation. They're concentrated in four countries, the African nations of Nigeria, Somalia, and South Sudan, and the Middle Eastern nation of Yemen. The UN says this constitutes the world's greatest humanitarian crisis since 1945 when the UN was founded. What do these four countries have in common? Conflict. In Nigeria, it's the fighting against the Boko Haram terrorist group combined with potential famine that has devastated parts of the country. In South Sudan, fighting between government troops and armed groups combined with a famine have left more than 40% of the population in need of food, farming help, and nutrition. In Somalia, attacks by the Islamic militant group Al-Shabaab plus a worsening drought are taking their toll. And in Yemen, a two-year-old civil war has left roads blocked, reduced imports, left markets damaged, and left millions hungry. So what can be done about this? The United Nations wants funding, $4.4 billion by this summer that would go toward fighting hunger and disease in these countries. Years of war have also destroyed parts of Iraq and Syria and helped give rise to the ISIS terrorist group, ISIS, an acronym for Islamic State in Iraq and Syria. That's what the terrorists wanted, based on their severe interpretation of Islam. But their two major strongholds in those two countries are now the targets of international efforts to destroy ISIS. A battle is looming over Raqqa, ISIS's self-declared capital in Syria. And the terrorists are losing their hold on the Iraqi city of Mosul after months of fighting there. But will all this rid the world of ISIS? What would that take? It began slowly from the ruins of two brutal wars in Iraq and Syria. But when will ISIS truly be gone? As US and allied firepower hone in on their final strongholds, they may almost fall as fast as they rose when they emerged in 2014 and declared their leader, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, head of their caliphate in Iraq and Syria. The territory grew in Iraq, exploiting the suffering of the Sunni minority and in Syria, offering a savage sense of order among the indiscriminate murder of the civil war. Their brutality became ubiquitous, yet also appealed to warped minds globally. In Libya, a franchise on the coast, in Afghanistan and the east, in Egypt, around Africa, even southern Russia, pledges of allegiance were made because to be part of ISIS, all you had to do was make a video or a phone call during an attack and you were part of the global branded enterprise of horror. Paris, Brussels, Orlando, Nice, Istanbul, the list would have to be a lot longer to include all those who claim to act in their sick name. Yet as they wane in Iraq and Syria and lose their Libyan strongholds altogether, they're not over yet. Their idea lives on. The virus of their perverted version of Islam now contagious perhaps forever for anyone on the internet. The challenge going forward, how do you make ISIS lose its appeal to those drawn to something so deliberately vile? 10 second trivia. Which of these words describes a time when day and night are about the same length? Solstice, Allegro, Equinox or Invicta? Vernal and autumnal equinoxes, or spring and fall equinoxes, are when day and night are equal all over the world. The spring equinox is on March 20th this year, less than a week away. It's the first official day of spring in the Northern Hemisphere, and it feels nothing like it in many parts of the U.S. From Washington, D.C. to Massachusetts, blizzard warnings are in effect, with up to 18 inches of snow in the forecast for Boston and New York City. Schools were closed. Thousands of flights were canceled for airports in the path of the late winter storm. It's already slammed the Midwest, and this system could bring the Northeast its heaviest snowfall of the whole winter. Residents stocked up on food and supplies. State governments stockpiled sandbags, pumps, and generators in case there's flooding or the power goes out. Meteorologists say this was all caused when two low-pressure weather systems came together, forming a potentially potent nor'easter. And cold weather in general is affecting a large part of the U.S. population. Almost a third of all Americans are under some sort of winter weather alert this week. Many of them live near a lake. Let's talk about lake effect snow. As a boy growing up in Buffalo, New York, I knew it as a day off school. 
My dad knew it as a day he may not get home from work because it was just snowing too hard. But how does it work? Well, first of all, you need a lake because it's called lake effect snow. And the lake needs to be unfrozen. 35, 40, 45 degrees is great. And then the air that blows across it from the north or from the west can be 10 degrees. All of a sudden, the moisture from the lake mixes in with the cold air from the north and you get big clouds and you can get big snow. When it goes on land and goes uphill, all of a sudden you get significant lake effect snow. It can be two to three inches per hour. And depending on where you are, if you're just south of it or north of this lake effect band, it can look like a wall of snow is coming down. And so that's why you can be anywhere from a two to three inch snowfall in one county and just a few miles south, you can get 30 inches in one day. Nominations are open for the 2017 CNN Heroes. These are everyday people. You may know a potential hero who's making an incredible impact on a community. The 2016 Hero of the Year, Jason Aristizabal, was born with cerebral palsy, and he's helped give a brighter future to more than a thousand Colombian children with disabilities. After accepting his award from CNN, he visited another Colombian hero who's made it his life's work to help others. The 2016 CNN Hero of the Year is Jason, Jason Aristizabal. Aristizabal. Jason! Hola! 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 Está frío, pero eso. Comida se les entrega agua panela. Lo tiene bastante. Bastante. Me inspira mucho la forma de luchar de Jorge, la, la forma, la tenacidad, el entusiasmo que te pone. Pues se multiplica la comida aquí. Sí, muy bonito. Me inspira que todos los días hay que hacer algo por los demás. ¿Qué sintieron? ¿Mucho orgullo? ¡Claro! O sea, fue muy especial, me sentí muy orgulloso de ser colombiano y verlo usted ahí. Qué feliz ser parte de esta familia de RSNN, estoy muy contento, muy orgulloso, muy feliz. Agility events, test a dog's athleticism, its training, its connection with its owner, charging over A-frames, hurdles, through tunnels, and between weave poles makes for good TV. But when an animal isn't particularly skilled at these things, but competes anyway, that makes for great TV. Look at this, oh, what a nosedive, and he couldn't care less. <laughs> Here we go, way! <laughs> That's one of the best shots I've seen in a long time. Ollie, so he's probably a bit confused. <laughs> Some people think he should have. This, whoa! Little Jack Russell here, Ollie, with Karen from the Blue Cross. Closes out the group. This is the last of the small spots. He's all over the place, and so he should be. Uh, Ollie and Karen here. Ollie was re home from uh, Kimpton Blue Cross when he was around. <laughs> Some people think he should have stayed as lucky as he's an absolute handful. Ollie is totally crazy. So maybe he's not on course on the concourse, more energetic than synergetic, and more vigorous than rigorous. But agility is not beyond his abilities. He's still more agile than fragile, more boss than dross, and he's super. He's able to ollie over A-frames in a single hound. I'm Carl Azus. <laughs>